Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 83, Pitching Your Book at a Conference, an interview with Laura Drake, coming to you on Thursday, June 28, 2018. It's summer, so that means it's writer's conference season. Very exciting. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll have Thriller Fest in New York. We'll have Romance Writers of America in Denver. There's going to be a big uh, American Christian Fiction, uh, let's see, ACFW, American Christian Fiction Writers Conference coming up this summer. There are also so many smaller regional conferences. Some of them have just excellent reputations. In fact, you might be able to do as much at a smaller conference or more than you can at a big one. But wherever you're going and wherever you're thinking about going, either this year or next, kind of the point is to pitch to editors and agents if you're trying to get a publishing contract with a New York publisher. Now, there are lots of different kinds of advice that you can get out there on pitching, but Laura Drake is kind of a pitching pro, and she's taught about it lots and lots of times, so I asked her to come back and give us her best tips on getting ready to pitch and then actually doing the pitch. She's got really great advice. I think it's going to be super helpful for everybody. I'm going to get my husband to listen to this interview, no matter if he thinks, oh, I don't need to listen to your podcast. I hear you talk all the time. No, baby, I need you to listen to Laura, because <laughs> Laura is going to give you great tips on how you can start pitching, because John's coming with me again to the Romance Writers of America conference, and he's going to look up all the agents and editors who, who are there who, in addition to romance, also buy middle grade. So if you are thinking, but there isn't a conference in my genre, or I don't want to go to that conference or that conference because it's not my genre, consider looking up who the agents and editors are who are going to be at this or that conference and seeing if any of them also buy your genre. Because I have to say that uh, it didn't hurt John at all that out of 2,000 romance writers, he was, you know, the one out of maybe 10 people who were pitching middle grade. So uh, he might have been the only one pitching middle grade. So there you go. Think about what your odds are now that somebody might say, sure, go ahead, send me three chapters or 50 pages. So listen to Laura's advice. And most importantly, her best advice is be bold. Be brave and do it. All right, go get excited. Today's guest is author Laura Drake. Laura is a New York published author of women's fiction and romance. Her debut novel, The Sweet Spot, won the 2014 Romance Writers of America Rita Award. She's a wife, grandmother, and motorcycle chick in the remaining waking hours. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Kitty. Great to be here again. Thanks. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. So when you were here in May, uh, it was uh, episode 65. You were helping us understand the importance of the first five pages, regardless if you were pursuing traditional publishing or doing self-publishing. So tell us, what are we talking about today? Today is mostly involved with New York publishing because it's about pitching, Yay! Um, we're coming into conference season, and everybody is looking for tips on pitching, in person mostly. So that's what I figured I'd talk about. Excellent. Welcome, pitch warriors. <laughs> First a caveat, I stole some of this information from people that are much brighter than I am. <laughs> Brooks, Nathan, Bransford other people in the industry. So please, if you want to know more about pitching, look them up. Just Google pitching a novel. You'll be amazed at how much is out there. So where do you start? You've got to start with a one sentence pitch. It's also called an elevator pitch because you can give it in an elevator between floors if you happen to find some hapless agent in an elevator. <laughs> it's about 25 words, and it's the heart of your story. It's the essence of your book. It's the line you're going to dash off when somebody asks you, what do you write? Or what, is, what are you working on now? 
In short, it's something that will make people go, ooh, what's that about? Or smile or laugh. You want to capture the essence of your book in 25 words or less. No problem, right? Right. (laughs) No pressure. Be brave, buttercup, you can do this. (laughs) It's hard. You need to do it anyway. Okay. A good, so what is this line? A good pitch is about what, not is about what happens. It's a one sentence description of the plot. A lot of people want to use their theme for their one sentence pitch. And the problem with that is, is that it ends up sounding generic, like every other book out there. For example, Kitty, did you read Eat, Pray, Love? I didn't yet. I'm probably the only person on the planet who hasn't, except for you, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I haven't read it, so I use an example from that. So the one-line pitch for that is not, a recently divorced woman searches for love and happiness. So what? Who cares, right? Yeah. Who is this woman And what did she do? You've got to get more specific to make people invested emotionally in your pitch. So a better pitch would be a recently divorced woman travels to Italy for pleasure, India for spirituality, and Bali for balance. But she finds love instead. Nice. Much better, huh? So I recommend strongly that you make your pitch character driven. I said this in the last segment and I still believe it. People come to stories not for a plot, they come for characters. So you need to give us something unique about your character in the very beginning to show us why we should care about this. Okay, here's some more examples. It's not A burning skyscraper threatens the lives of thousands, including a pregnant woman trapped on the top floor. Not bad, but how much better is this? A former firefighter fired for insubordination races to save the lives of thousands of people in a burning skyscraper, including his pregnant wife. Oh, See, that's exactly it. That's what they want to see. That's what you want to see. That's what you uh, want to see from people you're saying your pitch to, just like that. Ooh, what is that about? Yeah. Good one, Kitty. (laughs) Okay. We didn't even practice it. (laughs) I know. That's the best part. Okay, here's another one for you. It's not a man falsely imprisoned on death row will die at dawn if the governor doesn't pardon him. Instead, what's better, an intrepid reporter has only 24 hours to save the innocent man she's fallen in love with from execution. Right. That brings it back to the characters and their conflict. That's what makes a good pitch. In each case, we know who the hero is and what their quest is, but you've got to engage them emotionally. And I think that those second examples do. The last key element is a flash of flavor. Okay, you want to give them the tone of the book and a hint about your voice. That's important to sell an agent. For example, Dorinda Jones. I love her. Personally, as well as her writing. (laughs) Um, For her first grade series, this was her elevator pitch. Stephanie Plum meets the underworld. Private investigator Harley Davidson was born with three things. A smoking hot ass, a healthy respect for the male anatomy, And the rather odd job title of Grim Reaper. Wow. How can you not say, ooh, to that? Yeah, I remember when I first met her. um, Did I meet her? Uh, I think I might have met her in person uh, before I'd even heard about her. And when 
she did that pitch, I was like, okay, as soon as this meeting's over, I'm going to go buy that book. Exactly. And that's, and that's what you need. You need something that good. This agent or editor has been, for the most part at conferences, sitting there all day listening to the same blah, blah, blah all over again. You can see how this would wow them. Yeah. That's what you want. And the, it had the added bonus that it gives you a hint of her voice. I mean, right. that is Dorinda Jones right there. So, again, no pressure, right? right. One sentence that your entire career depends on. <laughs> okay, so how do you get one of those? You go out and you write it. We write, right? We can do this. Given enough time, we can do it. That's right. Then comes the hard part. Your family loves you. Your dog loves you. It does not help to practice on your family. Yeah. You've got to tell the mailman, the UPS man, the guy in the orange apron at the Home Depot store. Seriously, I mean, people you don't know and could care less about, right? You're going to pitch an agent who will care. So why not test on these people that don't matter? Honestly, I've done it. So the idea, the idea here is that um, you're, you're seeing whether or not someone who doesn't know you and doesn't know what in the heck you're doing is going to give you that ooh at the end? Exactly right. Oh. And a chance to practice at the same time. Right. Walk up to them, say, look, I'm an author. I've written a book. Can you tell me what you think of this pitch? <laughs> they will be flattered that you're asking them after they're done being surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Let's to do this. Let's face it. But do it. It's worth it because when you get that, ooh, you know you've got it. Right. So we have no pride, right? We're writers. We can <laughs> That's <do it>. right. <laughs> okay, so now let's say you've got a five or a ten-minute pitch appointment. You need more than an elevator pitch. You need a couple of paragraphs. But I'm telling you, you need less than you think you do, and I'll explain why at the end. So what do you put in those two paragraphs? If you have a query letter already done, you're pretty done. It's basically what goes into a query letter. What is the setting? Who is the protagonist? What do they want? Why can't they have it? What do they do to overcome this conflict? Basically it. Yeah. Is it easy? No. But you got to do it. You got to do it when you're going to um, send a query letter anyway. So right. most of your work's done. Here is the pitch for The Lion King. All right. It, it's a couple of paragraphs, but it shows you what you want to pull out of your 85 to 100K word book in a pitch. My book is a 77,000 word middle grade novel titled The Lion King. Simba is a rambunctious lion club, cub living in the animal kingdom of Tanzania. As heir to the throne, Simba can't wait to surpass his father and become king. But when Scar, Imba's, Simba's evil uncle, that's another thing. Honestly, when you write your pitch and you say it out loud, if you're stumbling over words, reword the sentence. Oh, right. This one's very hard to read. Simba's evil uncle uses Simba to lure the king to a death trap. Simba's overcome with guilt. Unable to deal with his role in the death of his father, Simba runs away and abandons his kingdom when they need him the most. While Simba's away, Scar seizes the throne and drives the animal kingdom into the ground. When Simba finds out, he has to make a choice. Continue his life in exile or overcome his guilt and battle Scar for control of the crown. 
Now notice, there is no mention of any of the other massively cool characters in this story. Right. It's because in a two to three paragraph pitch, you want to boil your book down to the essence. And the most important thing is your protagonist. So you want to focus on him, his problems, and what he does to fix it. Strip your story down to the minimum and then wow them with the details. So they ask for follow-up questions. Right. You know, reading that, it sounds so easy. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard. Here's an example of a bad pitch. Because I think examples help you to see the difference. Yeah. Story title pits brash but brilliant industrialist, main character, against an enemy whose reach knows no bounds. When main character finds his personal world destroyed at his enemy's hands, he embarks on a harrowing quest to find those responsible. This journey at every turn will test his mettle. With his back against the wall, main character is left to survive. Blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Seriously, that is so generic. It could be a thousand different stories. That could be uh, The Hobbit. Right. Actually, what it is is one of the superhero movies. Is it? which one, but really, what difference does that make? Because you can't even tell. Right, yeah, it could be The Firm. Uh, yeah, it, honestly, it could be. Yeah. So, um, what you, okay, so this one couldn't be much worse because it doesn't really tell us anything. It's not far from something like, there's a good guy, there's a bad guy, Things happen, really bad things. Right. (laughs) I mean, come on. Okay, so hopefully this teaches you avoid generalities. You need to be specific to make the gatekeeper care. The other thing this teaches you is avoid cliches. Yeah. Cliches are lazy. And you can't afford to be lazy in a pitch. Every single word should mean something. So, cliches, general, bad. Okay? All right. So now, let's say you've tested this on the Home Depot man. (laughs) You're ready. You've got everything written right down to the exact words you want and every and is in the right place it's so sparkly you have to wear sunglasses (laughs) when you right now you got to do it (laughs) that's a whole nother thing um the only way to be prepared is to practice i mean you're going to be nervous you're going to forget your name. (laughs) So if you can't say this in your sleep and your husband doesn't tell you you're saying it in your sleep, you're not ready. (laughs) You've got, seriously, I mean, do it in front of a mirror because you also need to be aware of what you look like as you speak. If you look like this the whole time, (laughs) it's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, So... Practice, practice, practice. Driving in the car, you practice your pitch. You know, um, fixing dinner, say it out loud, put it to music. (laughs) You just have to practice the hell out of it. Okay, so now you are ready. You, it is the day of. (laughs) I'm getting nervous talking about it. (laughs) I've done this. This is just not easy. And I am an extrovert, okay? Introverts, oh my God, I feel so badly for you people because even as an extrovert, I was freaked. Yeah. But we can do this. People ahead of you have done it. Thousands of people, thousands of people after you will do it. Yeah. You can do this. 
Okay. Obviously, you are going to look your best. You are going to look professional, right? You're going to have the hair done and the makeup done and wearing your best whatever. But you also have to prepare yourself physically, okay? You're going to put your shoulders back. You're going to sit up straight. You're going to smile, introduce yourself, shake their hand normal professional stuff but try and behave as if if it weren't for behave as if i would not have had a career as a cfo <laughs> right am i right kitty I absolutely mean uh, yeah if the corporate world teaches you anything it's to act as if you're already there act as if you already have the correct answer that the answer is yes yeah, so you're saying act as if this is already a done deal, but not in a um, full of yourself sort of way, just confident. Right, and, and it's all for you, right? I mean, this is internally, you're acting as if you're already a published author, even though you're afraid you're going to wet your pants in front of this lady, right? Right. <laughs> Or oh. cry. My very first pitch I, I, it was all I could do to get away from the table before the tears actually came out of my eyes. And I knew that she could tell that I was oh, about to cry because her eyes got bigger and bigger. Oh, oh, Kitty, you cried. Oh, it was terrifying. I was just a mess. <laughs> well, at least she knew you were genuine, right? <laughs> That's right. And, and that you cared. Yeah. Which is important. Okay. So you sit down and she's probably going to ask you, tell me about your book. You're going to give her the title, the genre, the word count, and then you launch into your pitch. No cheat sheets. I know. Really? You do it without cheat sheets? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, I always have the three by five card in my hand just in case so I don't, like, totally screw up and throw up. <laughs> uh, yes. I'm not saying you shouldn't have one, but keep it in your purse or in your pocket. Don't right. put it on the table in front of you because you'll read from it. Yes. And don't that, read from it. Yeah. Do not. I wanted to. We're good at reading, right? <laughs> yeah. But don't do it. Look them in the eye and give them the pitch. Okay? All right. Other tips. Be conversational. Okay? These guys are not machines. They are people. Yeah. They also don't want to hear a pitch that sounds like you rehearsed it in front of a mirror. <laughs> even though you did. So... Ask them how their day is going. Um, if you know anyone else in their uh, agency, ask about them. Ask how their conference is going. It will loosen you up, and they will realize that you're seeing them as a human being. Right. Okay. Keeping in mind how much time you have, because pitches used to be 15 minutes when I first started, then they were 10. And I think at RWA this year, is it three or five minutes? It's like a speed date. <laughs> and honestly, that is a great thing. Because what we did in those 10 minute pitch appointments is you get done with your pitch and then you'd start rambling. Oh my God, I hated that. I did it too. I knew better. I've taught pitch classes and I walked in there and freaking rambled all over her it was, <laughs> and all in my head I'm going shut up shut up, shut up, shut up. yes I was so freaked out yeah so, honestly shorter is better nowadays so that brings me to another point you get done with your pitch which you have practiced finish it Here's the hardest part about a pitch. Worse than sitting in the green room before it, shutting up. Seriously, say your pitch and your job is not to say a word. You know that old game where uh, the first person who speaks loses? <laughs> right. You're in that game. 
Do not say a word. She will fill the silence. You don't, because if you do, you're rambling. You're telling her about, you know, the dog's mother in your story. Yeah. That's not a good thing. So just shut up. Okay. Um, also, consider using, she's going to talk about things, but consider using your extra time to ask her questions. This is an agent, right? This is, she's the gatekeeper. She's got the information. She's yeah. happy to give it to you, but you have to tell her what you want to know. Yeah. Ask her what's hot in the industry. What does she see um, coming up next? What has she seen in a query that she really liked? All this information that you sit at home and go, God, I wish I knew. Ask her. Okay? And it will relax you as well because you're not the one on the hot seat. She is. She <laughs> right. Questions. <laughs> and, okay, so... What she wants to know is basically you're a professional. You have an enthusiasm for your writing, which honestly, I know that that was one of the low points of your life where you cried at the end, but she knew you cared. Yeah. Okay. That was not always a bad thing. Um, also that you're not a head case. And if you ramble, you look like one. <laughs> oh, because I've done it. Um, okay, so she may ask you questions, he, mm -hmm. she, that you're going to want to be prepared for. Now, how do you prepare for a question that you don't know? Just be aware that it may come up. One thing they may ask you is, are you working on anything else? Honestly, that freaked me out. My, I was on my call, my agent call, where she was trying to decide if I was a head case, whether she wanted to take me on or not. <laughs> and she asked me that, and I wasn't ready for it. The only thing I had was a book in the drawer that I never wanted to look at again. But I can't say no, right? I can't say, oh, yeah, no, I wrote these books, you know, the, in the series that I wanted to sell, but I haven't written anything else. Well, of course you can say that, but I didn't know it. So I blurted out about this book. She goes, oh, okay, send it to me. Oh, and no. Out from the dust bunnies, dust it off. And then, of course, I had to edit it like five more times. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad I did. I mean, I'm proud of the book, but, oh, God, don't do it. At least be prepared for that question. Yeah. <laughs> she may ask you, who are your favorite authors? Uh, what kind of writer are you? Now, that's really generic and not helpful, right? Right. What she's probably going to ask you is about <clears throat> what themes do you like to explore? For example, my books are... And it says, frankly, too much about me, but it's usually about guilt <laughs> and loss and, yeah. and, and redemption and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that's what she's looking for. Where did this story come from? Which is actually a cool question because wherever the idea came from, it's usually an interesting answer. You that's know? true. Yeah. Okay. So additional tips. These are like... Uh, extra credit. Let's face it, we're kissing up, right? This is right. the most bizarre industry that I've ever heard of where you are coveting and courting and almost stalking this person who's going to end up working for you. Yeah. This is, this is just insane. I don't know whoever thought of this. I hope they're burning in hell. Anyway. <laughs> Seriously, it's bizarre. So um, where the heck was I going with that? Oh, so take them. You really are sucking up to them to a certain extent. Take them chocolate. Oh. You're going. No, seriously. These people are sitting here for hours listening Good to point. pitch after pitch. Think about if you're an agent, wouldn't you just dread conferences? 
show them yeah. that you know that this isn't easy for them either. Bring them a glass of water. Right. Bring them a bottle of water. Bring them a hard candy or some chocolate just to show them that you know they're human. It really counts. Um, I don't waste your good outfit and your great makeup and hair. I, when I was pitching at RWA National, I don't remember which one, and I pitched it so many. Yeah. You know, they have the bullpen where everybody sits waiting for their appointment. I had an appointment with two agents, and I got done with those. I came back out and sat down. There are a zillion people who chicken out. Yeah. Every single, every single time slot had someone who didn't show. The agent is sitting there for 10 minutes, totally blank time. They are bored, checking their phones. They'd much rather hear a pitch. I ended up pitching seven times that day. <laughs> Just because they call out, they go, so-and-so agent uh, has an opening. She takes da-da-da-da. I didn't care if she took what I read or what I wrote. I went in and pitched. Most of them were inspirational agents that year. I don't know if there weren't many inspirational authors or if they were the ones that check it out more. I don't know. But I ended up, and now I don't write inspirational. But guess what? they knew agents in their agencies who did take what I wrote. Ah. I ended up with several names they told me to pitch, to send in a pitch to, and to let them know that I pitched this person and they told me to pitch, you know, to send in the query, the proposal. Wow. So I ended up with personal references basically from these people that I never would have anyway. Don't waste your makeup. Yeah. And do it. You're yeah. gonna be you're gonna be brave to do this anyway. Why not do it to the second power, right? That's right. Um Kitty, you got any st pitch stories for us? You know, it's funny because, uh, so you heard, you heard my first pitch story when I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know what to say or how to say it. And I, I didn't have any of these tips that you gave us. And so um, I was just so flustered. And so, because I was beginning to understand what I was doing wrong as I was doing it. And so <laughs> since I'm a perfectionist, I was like freaking out inside. And finally, it was just sort of like coming out in tears. I'm like, no, not tears. <laughs> But it's interesting because my husband, John, had a really similar experience to you. Um, he'd never been to a writer's conference before. He started writing middle grade fiction, um, I don't know, three or four years ago, probably. And so two years ago, I told him, I said, well, just come with me to the RWA conference, the national conference. It was in San Diego that year. So it was just like an hour's drive. I was going to have a hotel room anyway. You know, he didn't have to take time off work. It was just going to be, it couldn't really be any easier. <laughs> And he's like, I'm not going to a romance writers convention. I'm like, no, no, no. The RWA conference is full of a gazillion people who do romance and lots of other things. I said, okay. so I want you to look at the list of all the agents and editors who are going to be there. I want you to go to every single one of them's website and find out all the things that they buy and highlight all the people who are interested in middle grade. And then you know, we'll try to get you an appointment with one or two of them and you give them your pitch and see what happens. Well, so we get there and I'm introducing them, you know, to all of my friends from the Orange County chapter in California. And uh, I think it was our friend, Deb Mullins, you know, Deb. Oh, um, yeah. I, I think it was Deb who said, you know, John, you know, you're not going to be interested in going to the, uh, any of the workshops that have to do with romance since you write middle grade, you probably should go to things like character and plotting and stuff like that. She's like, but you're here. So why don't you just take the day, go down there, sit in that area and, and have your list of all the highlighted names. These are all the people who, who take middle grade in addition to the fact that they're here at the romance conference and just wait for people to say so-and-so has a spot. It was exactly what you did. And he must have pitched to eight or nine. I can't remember if every single person wow. <laughs> asked him to send in some work or if he pitched to a, 
like any people who didn't, but he got at least seven or eight requests. And I have to admit that a lot of our friends, they were so mad. This man who doesn't even write romance comes in and takes over and gets all these requests. And really that wasn't it. It was somebody who was willing to swallow their fear and just do it. I am so glad that you told that story because that's what it's all about. The future favors the bold, right? Yeah. Go out there and do it. You want to sell your book. That's what it takes. Exactly. One last tip. Once you get home and get over the whole experience, <laughs> send it. My agent told me at conference, I said, oh, you know, I'll wait to send you this because I know after conference, you're going to be swamped with all these submissions from the people picked. She looks at me and goes, do you know, I'll bet I don't get 25% of the people who pitched, I never get their proposal. Wow. You do the hard part which is the pitching and the easy part, which is sending an email. You don't do it. Yeah. Now the only thing I can think, I, I'm sure some of them have proposals ready. I don't get it, but some of them may not. So yeah. the last tip is if you haven't finished your book, you shouldn't be pitching. If it isn't ready to send in, when you leave for conference, you shouldn't be pitching. Save your chances for when you're really ready. Now, just That's to be fair, yeah, and I was just going to say, just to be fair, there are people who have the exact opposite opinion, um, who are like, take all of your chances that you have and bust your butt to get it to them if they ask for it. But both, both ways of looking at it have pros and cons. Your way is like, just do it, send it in, like find out right away. Well, you may not hear back from them right away. It depends on their personal you schedule. <laughs> yeah. But at least when you, um, when you pitch something that you're prepared to send, you're right. You can just go home, get it done. Now it's in their hand. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm not saying maybe you shouldn't send to every single agent you've researched, right? Um, but send to the people who requested. Yeah. Cause you did all the work you did. You were brave. You did it. You cried. <laughs> yeah. Don't send it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because the whole point is you spent all this money and all this time and all this preparation because of the, in particular, more, if you're trying to get published with a traditional publisher, Honestly, more than any other reason that you got went to this conference is that so you can meet somebody who can help you move your dream to the next stage. Exactly. Take full advantage. Yeah. Because depending on the conference, you can buy a flash drive that has the recordings of all the classes that you missed. That's right. That's what it's all about. You're there to pitch. Yeah. Now, so we're talking at the end of June, and the Romance Writers of America National Conference is in Denver in mid-July. I know that Thriller Fest is the week before, I think, and I believe in New York City. Uh, I know a lot of people who are going to American Christian Fiction Writers, and that's also somewhere in the summertime. So people have a couple of options. Um, feel like they're ready, they've got the money, they're going to see if they can sign up into an empty space and get in, or take a year to take all of the advice they've learned about creating the manuscript, creating the pitch, and then, you know, getting, the, one of the things about signing up early for a conference is that you're more likely to get a pitch appointment with someone that you want, depending on how a conference arranges their appointments. That's true, and not all conferences are in the summer. Um, smaller regional conferences are sometimes an awesome place to pitch because it's less pressure. It's more relaxed. True. Um, there aren't as many agents there, but if they rep what you like, who cares? What yeah. You, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, that reminds me because I remember being so surprised that um, a really big editor from Avon was at one of our regional conferences in Southern California. And I was like, but she's like one of the biggest editors there. And then I thought, and there's only like 200, not 2000 people. So even I was like, okay, I want an appointment with her. I have to think of something to pitch her that I think she would like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's not always about the big conferences. The small conferences have a lot to offer as well. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So people just need to decide when and where, find the conference that they think they want to go to, whether it's this year's or next year's. And, and do then, it. And do it. Just be brave. That's right. I love it. This is great advice. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Kitty. Absolutely. Well, um, and people... <laughs> Laura and I were talking before we did the recording, you know, is there anything else that, um, that we can offer you besides going to conferences? And both of us are like, I've never done one of the Twitter pitches. Okay, we won't talk about that. But if you don't know that there is such a thing, there are Twitter pitches. And honestly, I would Google Twitter pitches and ask your friends because somebody you know knows how to do this. And they're usually like an eight or 12 hour day where you're just doing a 140 character pitch or whatever, you know, Twitter's letting you do now and agents are just sitting there in front of their computer reading pitch after pitch after pitch for a day and people get asked to send you know three chapters or a full so it happens and you don't have to do it in front of them it's wonderful that's right there's no crying or throwing up necessary there you or or if you do at least they won't see you do it that's right <laughs> Yeah, I think at that point, I'd be like, oh my gosh, she asked for, for a full manuscript. I do have to throw up now. <laughs> exactly. oh, so uh, Twitter, conferences, um, anything else that we can think of that is a way to get your work, your pitch in front of an agent or editor? Those are the well, big ones. There's querying and all of that as well, too, but it's a totally different animal. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is when somebody is specifically saying, I'm ready to take your information, your pitch now. Right. Excellent. It's in person. I love it. Oh, also, this is great. What's that? It's in person most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Laura, tell us, where can readers find you? Sorry, I always say readers because as a writer, I'm so used to saying it. But where can I'd love to have readers find me. Believe me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, tell, tell us where people can find you in your books. Okay. Um, my website's the best place to begin with. It's lauradrakebooks.com. And I do have uh, what I call the right stuff. It's short, usually around seven-minute podcasts covering different topics that will help writers, craft, writer's life, things like that. You'll find it on my website. Um, Facebook, I only post cute uh, pet memes, odd <laughs> facts, positive quotes. It's all positivity. It's Laura Drake on Facebook. Twitter is PBR Writer, which does not stand for Paps Blue Ribbon. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Professional Bull Riding, which was my first uh, series that I wrote. Right. I am running for national treasurer for RWA. So if you're an RWA member, I hope I can get your vote. <laughs> Excellent. Last night, my favorite person on the planet, the UPS man, brought me arcs of my uh, book that's coming out in December. So oh. I'm excited about that. Nice abs, eh? Oh, my goodness. Okay, everybody who's watching on YouTube, I'm going to ask Laura to just put that closer to the camera. That is a beautiful cover, and it's the yeah. last true cowboy. Yep. I really am jazzed about it. Beautiful. Oh, that's so exciting. That's all about me. Excellent. And the, the last true cowboy, you say, comes out in October? No, it comes out December 4th. But December 4th. But pre-orders are great things. Woohoo! And it'll show up in your mailbox. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. I have to say, I love that. Waking up and turning on my Kindle and going, oh, my gosh, I forgot I ordered this book. <laughs> I know. I love it. Isn't it like a Christmas present? It is. It is. I love it. Uh, Laura, thank you so much. This is great. 
Thank you for having me again, Kitty.